you know, whatever happened to singers like Jeffrey Osborne, Michael McDonald, people Bryson and them? Them boys could sing, man. They brought that grown and sexy romantic quiet storm R&B sound that even made the pop fans love their music. All races love their music. But another guy I got to put in that same category is James Ingram. He had that powerful, smooth, tender voice that fans say it was like a, the fans, they was like, his voice was like a howling sound. And he could do R&B and pop too. The crazy part is James never wanted to be a singer. He thought his voice wasn't good enough, but that all changed when the great Quincy Jones heard him, though. He won Grammys. He got Golden Globe Award nominations and Academy Award nominations. Only problem James had all of his career, right, was that his record label wanted him to be a crossover artist like Lionel Richie. They really, they really didn't want him to have an R&B fan base, which frustrated him throughout his career. So let's get into the story, right? Now, James Edward Ingram was born February 16th, 1952 in Akron, Ohio. And he was one of six children born to his parents. And many of y'all probably know his little brother too, Phil Ingram, who was one of the lead singers from the R&B group Switch. That was my group right there, Switch. But, you know, growing up, right, now James, he came from a very religious family. His father was the deacon of their church, and he was also the Sunday school teacher. And they went to church like three times a week. And James said in the interview that he never even watched a movie until he was like 18 years old. He really wasn't allowed to do anything. But one thing for sure is he knew the Bible front to back. He knew that Bible, though. But, you know, he came from a musical family and grew up on gospel music. And one of his idols growing up, who he wanted to be like, was a jazz organist named Jimmy Smith. Now, as far as R&B music goes, some of his idols growing up, Donny Hathaway, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and Ray Charles. But, you know, he started to learn how to play the piano around the age of 12 years old. He taught himself by learning the chords to Stevie Wonder's hit song, My Sherry Amore. And he also learned by watching his older brother. Now, at that time, right, his older brother, Henry, he was the most talented in the family. <laughs> his older brother, Henry Ingram, was so talented that he became the minister of music for the whole state of Ohio. Wow. That's crazy. Now, by the time James got to the ninth grade, he had joined a local band of older musicians called Sharpie and the G Clefs that taught him and sharpened his musical skills. But after graduating high school, he, he enrolled to uh, Akron University on a track scholarship. And it was there he ended up joining a band called Revelation Funk. But he wasn't singing at the time. Like I said, believe it or not, James never considered himself a singer. He played keys for the band and, you know, he was sing background or whatever, but he really never considered himself a singer. And, you know, over the years, the Revelation Funk band he was in, their reputation grew and they even opened up for the Ohio players and they opened up for Donny Hathaway. But, you know, they was ready to take their career to the next level. So they left Akron, Ohio and went to Los Angeles, California to try to get a record deal. And they did have a little success with one song they recorded called Time Is On Our Side, which was for the soundtrack to the Dolomite movie. But after that, there wasn't much success, which made the rest of the band members return back home to Ohio. But James, you know, James was determined to make it as a musician. So he ended up staying in L.A. And that's when his girlfriend, Deborah, who later on became his wife, moved out there with him and brought him some recording equipment and he started to work on his demo 
But then one day he ended up working with some people who was signed to Ray Charles label at the time. And they had told Ray about how talented James was. And him and Ray met and they started doing a bunch of music together. He also got connected with Marvin Gaye around that time and started recording some backing vocals for him. Then James' little brother, Phil Ingram, and his group Switch, they ended up getting a record deal first with Motown after Jermaine Jackson heard their demo. And, you know, that made James happy for his little brother. He was very happy and proud of his little brother getting that record deal. Now, after that, he ended up signing to a publishing company. James had signed to a publishing company and he started writing songs and even though he never considered himself a real singer, he had to sing the songs he was writing for the publishing company, which paid him $50 for every song he did. Then he got with R&B artist Leon Haywood and he and James collaborated on the song She's a Bad Mamma Jamma by Carl Carlton, which was a big hit. That song was a big hit that went platinum and was nominated for a Grammy plus spent eight weeks at number two on the R&B soul chart. That's a cookout classic song for real right there. Now, James, he played the bass synthesizers and the chords on that song and did a lot of work on that album also. And you know what? James also did the bass synthesizer on the group Shalimar's hit song, A Night to Remember. That's my song too right there. He played the bass synthesizers on that song, A Night to Remember. Because look, him and Howard Hewitt, they were good friends because people don't know that. That's where he's from. That's where he's from. Howard Hewitt is from Akron, Ohio, too. They've been knowing each other for a long time. Howard Hewitt said he met James when he was about 15 years old. But anyway, right, so James, now signed to the publishing company, ended up collaborating with some other songwriters. He collaborated with songwriters Barry Mann and Cynthia Well on a song called Just Once. And look, he really wanted to give the song just once to Carl Carlton for his album, but his management team and Carl Carlton's management team and everybody didn't think that song fit at the time. So they turned the song down. But the good news was by James being signed with that publishing company, they would help find placements and pass his music around. And that song just once had got to Quincy Jones. And when Quincy heard it, he loved it and told him he wanted it for his album. You know, around that time, right? Quincy was on fire too, man. He had just produced the Michael Jackson off the wall album, which was selling millions of copies like crazy. And James, he just couldn't believe it that Quincy wanted him to sing the song. Because like I said, James never considered himself a real singer. When him and Quincy got to the studio to re-sing that song, James said he just kept he kept clearing his throat because he thought his voice was just too rough, too rough sounding. And that's when Quincy stopped him and told him, stop clearing your voice. Your voice is fine. That's your sound. That's why that's why he loved that song. And ever since then, the rest is history. And on March 26, 1981, Quincy Jones released the album titled The Dude. And the first single, Just Once, hit number 17 on the Billboard chart and was nominated for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance at the 1982 Grammy Awards. The song was also featured in the movie called The Last American Virgin. If y'all seen that before, back in the day, I remember that movie. But then Quincy, look, Quincy released a song called 100 Ways as the second single by James. And that song hit number 14 on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and number five in the U.S. and number six in Canada on the adult contemporary charts. Plus, he won his first Grammy Award for Best R&B Vocal Performance, making him the first artist in history to win a Grammy without even having an album out. Wow, that's big right there, y'all. The man didn't even have an album out yet, and he won a Grammy. That's crazy. You know, overall, that Quincy Jones album, that The Dude album, was nominated for 12 Grammy Awards. 
Now, after that, you know, Quincy started his own label called QS Records, which was distributed by Warner Brother Records as a joint venture. And he signed James. He signed James, making him one of the first artists to sign to his label. And, you know, you know, later on he signed, uh, Quincy Jones signed Patty Austin, Saida Garrett, Tevin Campbell, Tamia, and all, a bunch of other artists. But anyway, he signed James and they began to work on his debut album. But before his album was released, he had to help Quincy with some songs. You know, he helped Quincy with the Donna Summers 10th album. And he was featured on a song called Mystery of Love on her album. Then he was on another big song that took the world by storm, which was Baby Come to Me, which was a duet with R&B singer Patty Austin, Quincy Jones' goddaughter. And that song was big, man. That song hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100s and number one on the adult contemporary chart. And look, that song, right, when the ABC soap opera General Hospital started using it as one of their theme songs, the song shot straight to number one on the charts. I always thought that song too, man. That song was a beautiful song, man. Patty Austin and Jane's, Jane's voice, their voices just blended so good together, man. Beautiful song. Now, that same year, <laughs> that same year, we're going to stay in 1983. It was a big year for James. Quincy needed James to work on Michael Jackson's next album, which was Thriller. And, you know, James wrote the lyrics for the song PYT, Pretty Young Thing, which is probably one of my favorite songs off of that Thriller album, alongside Wanna Be Starting Something. That's my song, too. But PYT, that my junk right there. Look, Quincy Jones really, he actually sent seven people to, uh, to go write that song, to go write that song, PYT. But when he heard James' version, he said, we cutting this tomorrow. PYT, Pretty Young Thing, helped push that Michael Jackson Thriller album to over 70 million records sold worldwide. Unbelievable. Wow. That album. Look. We'll stay in 1983, right? That same year, that's when James released his debut album. It was called It's Your Night with the single title Ya Mo Be There featuring Michael McDonald. And that song ended up winning a Grammy Award for Best R&B Performance by a duo or group with vocals. And it also received a Grammy Award nomination for Best R&B Song, but, you know, it lost to I Feel For You by Shaka Khan. Yeah, Shaka Khan was running things too back then. But after that, he worked with legendary country singer Kenny Rogers on a song called What About Me? That hit number one on the charts. Now, in 1985, James was part of one of the biggest selling singles in music history, which is the song called We Are The World for the USA for Africa album, which went number one everywhere. The song went number one in ev everywhere, man. The whole world it was number one. Now, you can see footage of James on YouTube, too, in a studio session with all the artists when they was recording it. And look, that same year, he also helped Quincy Jones with the Color Purple soundtrack. He was on the Color Purple soundtrack, too. Now, on July 15th, 1986, he released his second album titled never felt so good with the single called always that helped push that album to certified gold months later that same year him and singer linda ronstadt they did that duet song called somewhere out there for the soundtrack of the animated movie american tell which ended up winning the grammy for a song of the year and the grammy for best song written specifically for a motion picture or television and it was nominated for best pop performance by a duo or group with vocal. Man, it was yo, James Ingram was big too, man. He was doing his thing. Then around May 1989, James released his third album titled It's Real with the beautiful classic single called I Don't Have the Heart. And you know, that hit number one on the US Billboard Hot 100 and was also nominated for a Grammy. 
I don't have the heart. You know what? The crazy part about that song, right? It was it was big on the pop charts, went number one, but it really didn't make an impact in the R&B world. It was like number 50 or 60 down there. I don't know. But it was big on the pop charts, though. Now, in 1990, James was featured on a single titled The Secret Garden with Al B. Shore, El DeBarge, Barry White for Quincy Jones' album Back on the Block. And that song went number one on the Billboard Black Singles chart and was certified gold. So there were 500,000 copies. That Back on the Block album, I remember I had the cassette tape, man. That album was crazy, too. It won a Grammy Award. No, that, that album won a Grammy for Album of the Year. Sold millions of copies. And look, it stayed number one. That Back on the Block album stayed number one on the R&B charts for 12 weeks. That's crazy. That was a big album. And that was also the first time we heard Tevin Campbell with that song Tomorrow, which also hit number one on the U.S. R&B chart. And it was written by Saida Garrett. Another song on that album I love was the remake of the Brothers Johnson song called I'll Be Good To You by Shaka Khan and Ray Charles. That was my junk right there. I just like that song. That song went number one too on the R&B charts and won a Grammy Award for the best R&B performance by a duo or group with vocal. Quincy, he won a lot of Grammys from that album, y'all. That album was crazy. Now, also that same year, right, James became the chairperson of the Black Family Reunion, which is an event celebrating African-American family culture, tradition, and history. Now, in 1991, James released a compilation album titled The Greatest Hits, The Power of Great Music. And that compilation album was certified gold. On May 25th, 1993, he released his fourth album titled Always You. And the song called Sing for the Children, that song became the theme song for the Children Defense Fund around that time. I think Hillary Clinton was part of that. After that, he continued to do, you know, he continued to do a lot of features like the theme song called The Day I Fall in Love, which was a duet with country singer Dolly Parton for Beethoven's second movie, that dog movie Beethoven. I know y'all remember that. And that was nominated for Academy Award, a Golden Globe Award, and a Grammy Award. That was big for him. He sung at Holly Robinson and uh, Rodney Pete's wedding. Him and Anita Baker did a duet for the soundtrack to the movie called Forget Paris with Billy Crystal. At the 2002 Super Bowl pregame show in New Orleans, he sung the song Let Freedom Ring with Barry Manilow, Yolanda Adams, Wyonna Judd, and Patti LaBelle. And you know, he just made a bunch of TV appearances and did a lot of performances and he just kept himself busy, man, raising his kids and taking care of his family. Now, 15 years later, since his last album, he released his fifth and final album on October 14th, 2008, which was titled Stand in the Light, and it was an independent release. It was more like an R&B gospel album he was going for. But after that, you know, he just continued just to tour, perform all around the world. I mean, he had money coming in from all them royalties, especially off that, uh, that Michael Jackson Thriller album. <laughs> He's getting royalties off that. And, you know, he also did the Soul Train Cruise thing. But see, around 2015 though, right? People close to James started to notice that it was hard for him to remember things. His memory was going bad. And it got to the point where he had to retire and stop performing. And around 2017... According to his brother, Phil Ingram, he said James' memory became so bad that he couldn't even hold a conversation with him. And that's when he was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, in which their mother also had too. Their mother had it too. And on January 29th, 2019, James Ingram, he died from brain cancer. He died from brain cancer. His death was announced by his good friend, actress Debbie Allen, on Twitter. You know, she was devastated too, man. 
sad man but you know like i said he had been suffering from parkinson's and an early onset alzheimer's diseases and truly be missed man his music will live on forever he was a great singer great singer and just an all-around talented musician man 66 years old y'all he was 66 years old rest in peace james ingram <laughs>